Good evening. Welcome to the USGS and another installment in our continuing public lecture series. I'm delighted to see you here tonight. Some of you may know that the traffic is horrendous, a big power outage. So I don't know how many people made it over here. But I'm glad you made it. Most of you know that before I introduce tonight's speaker, I always let you know about next month's lecture because I want you to come back in this continuing series. Next month, Steve Fort here is speaking about global trends in mineral commodities supplies. Now you might think that mineral commodities supplies sounds pretty dry, but let me tell you, if you live in a house and you drive a car and you have a smartphone in your pocket, you should care about mineral commodity supplies. So please do join us next month uh, to talk about global trends. It's kind of the intersection of science and geology and politics and economics, so it should be fascinating. Tonight's speaker is Dr. John French. John French is the director of the USGS Pawtuxent Wildlife Research Center in Maryland. So we're very happy that he uh, took the time to fly across the country and come and visit us in, in the Golden State. <laughs> um, John French oversees research on a variety of topics, including wildlife toxicology, coastal ecology, population modeling and decision science, and a variety of monitoring programs, some of which you may have heard of, the American Bird Banding Lab and the Breeding Bird Survey. <clears throat> the Pawtuxet Center also has responsibility for the North American vertebrate collection that is housed in the Smithsonian's Museum of Natural History. John also, in his position, sits on the US-Canada Whooping Crane Recovery Team, and he has been involved in whooping crane conservation for many years. His scientific training was a, a doctorate, at a PhD, at the University of Wisconsin in Maryland on the ecology and physiology of land animals. And he was initially hired at Patuxen to undertake wildlife, uh, excuse me, to undertake research in wildlife toxicology. He's been there with, since 1993, longer than the Patuxent Wildlife Research Center has been part of the USGS. We are delighted to have him out here, and please join me in welcoming Dr. John French. Talk about what's in a name. <laughs> Thank you for that nice introduction. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Glad you br were able to brave the, the traffic to get here. Uh, <clears throat> I'm very pleased tonight to talk about uh, <clears throat> natural history collections and museum-based research that we do at the Patuxent Wildlife Research Center. And uh, uh, for the benefit of the USGS and the Department of Interior in the nation, uh, <clears throat> our, our museum group is as you heard, housed downtown in D.C. at the uh, Smithsonian's National, National, sorry, National Museum of Natural History. Easy for you to say. Uh, <clears throat> it's a, uh, they do a lot of really cool, cool work there with their colleagues at the Smithsonian. And <clears throat> by the way, in my uh, introductory slide here, I'd just like to point out that this snake uh, actually just had lunch before it was collected. And you can see that it's got a big gecko in its gut. And I'll, I'll tell you more about this later, but I like this slide because it exemplifies a couple of the themes you'll hear about during my talk. And those themes are species identification, invasive species, that gecko in the gut of that snake is, is an invasive species, uh, human health and safety, and um, a variety of new techniques that are applied to, to museum specimens. Let's see if I can do this right here. Let me just do that. You know, many of us biologists uh, got started looking at animals when we were younger, trying to identify them. And uh, perhaps you did some of that yourself. Uh, maybe you're bird watchers or have a pollinator garden or, or just like being out, outdoors. Uh, most of us started out uh, by using field guides. And field guides have, are really packed full of all sorts of life history information um, and I don't know if you've ever 
wondered where all that life history information comes from, but really it comes from uh, uh, natural history museums and specifically research collections at natural history museums. So that's the subject of my talk today. Uh, what is a, a natural history museum? Uh, what are the collections used for at research museums like that? And uh, what are the benefits of, of work that comes out of uh, uh, folks that work at museums? So let me introduce to you our, our group there at the Smithsonian. We call them the Biological Survey Unit. Uh, <clears throat> this unit was formed in 1889, only a couple of years after the U.S. Geological Survey was formed. At that point, it was called the Bureau of Biological Survey. And they were <clears throat> commissioned to investigate and record the, the diversity of, of vertebrates in North America. And really, that mission continues today, uh, pretty much just as it was except with a whole lot better technology and a whole lot of new methods and uh, a whole lot of different and interesting questions that they have to answer as well. As I mentioned, the BSU is stationed at the National uh, Museum of Natural History. And <clears throat> we, while we curate the, the North American collection of vertebrates, that's mammals, birds, amphibians, and reptiles. I realize fish are vertebrates, but we don't do them. We do the terrestrial ones. Um, and this, the, those, um, that section of the collection is really by far the largest part of the collection at the Smithsonian. You can see those, the, you know, for mammals, we have about the same amount of, <clears throat> of specimens in the North American collection as we do in all the rest of the collection uh, for the rest of the world. More birds in our collection than in the, uh, the world collection at the Smithsonian, and many more herps, herps, that's reptiles and amphibians together. So almost, um, we're well over a million specimens are curated by our group there. So that's, that's a lot of work. And uh, in, in, indeed, the mammal collection is one of the best in, uh, mammal collections in the world in terms of its comprehensiveness and, and detail. Uh, so, and so people from all over the world come to work with us there at the museum. It's kind of fun. You go down there, and there are all sorts of people running around. And, you know, you see, you see very, very interesting people down there. So you've heard me use the word specimen <clears throat> a couple times, and I just want to start from the beginning here. A physical specimen really is the basic unit of all natural history collections, a physical specimen. And, <clears throat> and we're, what we're looking at here are a couple of, uh, or three, specimens of the eastern red-eared bat, a very pretty little bat, has a little bit of a red coloration. So these specimens are, are physical specimens, are taken into the collection, preserved very carefully. The idea is to hang on to these specimens really forever. Of course, nothing lasts forever, but we try our best to preserve the, the tissues and the fur and the bones and, and even the, the soft parts in, in alcohol are kept for many, many years. The idea is to put them in, in a, uh, uh, a condition that they will last for an awful long time, which is you know, the point. <clears throat> so how do, we, how do we collect these specimens? Well, early on in the life of a collection, really expeditions to go find specimens and bring them into the collection or bring them into the museum is really what you know forms the bulk of the work. And you can kind of imagine these old guys with long mustaches out there with shotguns collecting stuff, and indeed that's what they looked like. Uh, <clears throat> the, the, um, so you go out and trap and shoot or, or net or do whatever you can get, do to, to gather these animals in. Today, we don't really do that quite so much. Um, first of all, we realize that collecting animals in the wild actually does impact those populations in a way that is somewhat counter to the whole purpose of having the knowledge that comes from a collection in the first place. So oftentimes, what is done is animals are, are scavenged. That is, dead animals are picked up. Actually, roadkill is a fairly common way of getting new specimens into the collection. Um, early on in my graduate career, here's a little gruesome story. I was out riding my bike, getting some exercise, sick of that damn seminar I was in kind of thing. And uh, <clears throat> riding around the countryside in Wisconsin, and I was zipping along, and I saw this animal on the road, and I, I just stopped. I don't know why. I stopped. Turns out it was a least weasel. I'd never even seen a least weasel before. I picked it up, wrapped it up in my shirt, stuck it in my saddlebag, and brought it back to the, 
to the very small museum at the University of Wisconsin and skinned it out, and that was my first introduction to museum collections. But it's that kind of sort of serendipitous um, collection of specimens that now forms really a lot of how we get specimens into the collection. <clears throat> so how do you create a specimen? Well, I mentioned a little bit that <clears throat> uh, about, about preserving the, the, the specimen, but after an animal is collected, an awful lot of work goes into preparing the specimen. Obviously, you have to identify the thing first. And I had an idea what that weasel was, but I wasn't exactly sure when I picked it up off the road. So I had to identify it first. Um, <clears throat> and usually that proceeds by comparing it to other specimens in the collection or field guides. Or if you can't, take a picture and, and sending information off to colleagues around the world and finding out what's going on. Hopefully you do it correctly. Um, <clears throat> so preparation of the specimen is very important, as I mentioned. Usually mammals are skinned. Uh, the bones, the carcass is taken out, and the the, uh, the the bones and all the all the flesh are put in a in a bin with a bunch of sarcophagus beetles. That is beetles that eat the flesh off the bones. And after several weeks of that, you go back and you can retrieve the bones. They're absolutely absolutely clean after these beetles have chewed off all the flesh, and those bones are kept. And you can see that these vials here are actually. Uh, uh, bones that belong to each one of these specimens here. Not the entire, entire skeleton, but some of it. Um, <clears throat> very importantly, there is a label prepared for each specimen. And here's a kind of a blow up of a, of a label up here, up on the top. Not quite sure why we have this thing along the bottom of the screen here, but I guess uh, Apple wanted to make its presence known here. Um, <clears throat> a label is a very important part of the physical specimen. It holds the absolute most important information about that physical specimen. The species, the date and location of collection, the color of soft tissues. Soft tissues, uh, once they dry out and age, lose their color. And being able to recall what the animal looked like in, when it was very fresh is, is an important part of, the, part of the data that goes along with the specimen. Um, also, some oftentimes measurements are made, um, and <clears throat> well, not on the label. Sometimes uh, soft parts, as I mentioned, are removed. Often the gut is removed, gonads are removed, parasites that are found on the outside and the inside of the animal are preserved in alcohol, all associated with that one specimen. So, in order to uh, in order to make sure that we know which data goes with which specimen, the the um, catalog number. This number right up here is by far the most important bit of information that goes on each specimen. And all those, all those data that I'm talking about, the measurements, the coloration, the collection field notes, photographs, uh, and today, um, <clears throat> you know, gene sequences, if, if genetic work has been done on the specimen, all of that data gets stuck in a database. You know, one of these fancy relational databases today where everything is connected with uh, um, in this case, by the catalog number. Um, <clears throat> all that goes into a, a very big database that's um, actually publicly available. If you're interested in going on the uh, database of the National Collection, you can certainly do that online. Um, <clears throat> okay, all that's gathered together, and these animals are, are laid out nicely in this tray with labels on them. And then the thing is installed. This sounds a little funny. Maybe it sounds a little bit like an art exhibition, but you take the the tray and you locate it properly in among all the cabinets of specimens within the museum. And that location is important because usually they're put next to very similar species, maybe similar species from this continent, maybe from other continents. It depends what the particular curator is interested in at the moment. And it's the comparison of, of uh, information across these different uh, <clears throat> collections that really provides the power of <clears throat> information from, from museums. So a series of specimens becomes a collection that can be analyzed <coughs> and used for many different topics. So what are these collections good for? Well, <coughs> uh, here's a series of specimens. Uh, these are all song sparrows, as it turns out. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen song sparrows. <coughs> uh, and you can certainly see that there's quite a bit of, of variation in coloration among these animals. In fact, variation in size as well. <clears throat> so how does this tray of birds relate 
say, to current management issues. A lot of what we do is provide information that helps land management agencies and wildlife managers across the country do the work that they do. Well, one thing that's important to, to wildlife managers is the description of subspecies. Subspecies are useful because, or necessary in many cases, because they are the unit of protection that's uh, enshrined in the Endangered Species Act. If there is an endangered subspecies, the act re requires the Fish and Wildlife Service to go out and, and decide whether the, it deserves, uh, well, if it's a very uncommon subspecies, the Fish and Wildlife Service must go decide whether it's a, a worthy of protection <coughs> under the Endangered Species Act. So very importantly, the museum folks sort of delineate that subspecies designation. Which group of organisms are we actually talking about when we're talking about a subspecies? Is it really a subspecies? It's very interesting. As we go through and work with some of these specimens, we find that species that we thought were, were, were distinct actually, or subspecies that we thought were distinct actually are not. And in other cases, you know, uh, subspecies are carved out of what was initially thought to be one, one single species. It turns out that these two left-hand birds on this tray, the two large ones, are indeed a distinct subspecies of song sparrow. <coughs> um, and actually about 30% of all the birds that are protected under the Endangered Species Act are subspecies. I think there are 31 of them, so you do your math, there's about 100 entities protected under the Endangered Species Act. Turns out four of them are here in California. So for your ornithologist, it's the California least tern. Uh, the southwestern willow flycatcher, very hard to identify, uh, the le least bells vireo, and then the western snowy plover. Those plovers are, uh, those small little plovers are endangered just about everywhere, every species too. So, um, <clears throat> My ornithologist colleague says, why don't you ask people why they're so hard on their other uh, subspecies in California? I said, I don't know. I'm sure you're not hard on them, but. Another value of collections is to try and figure out what the distribution of animals are on, and here on a continental scale, and particularly for bats. Um, <clears throat> and again, these are eastern red bats we're looking at. Uh, they're not very, they're not readily observable in the wild. They're nocturnal. Uh, they do chatter a little bit, but usually very, very softly, so you don't hear them much. Uh, people, some people, don't like bats very much, so they don't pay much attention to them maybe try and get away from them. Uh, but <clears throat> so it, especially for an animal like this that's hard to see in the wild, um, <clears throat> museum collections are very useful in determining ranges and migration schedule and that kind of thing. So here's a map of, of locations in the east where the Easter red bat has been found. <clears throat> and uh, I don't believe these are all the locations in our collection, but the range is, is there listed in gray. <clears throat> so here's a collection of um, a really very attractive collection of eggs. I particularly like those white ones with the squiggly brown marks on them. Um, it's a very pretty, you know, set of, of of eggs. And of course, we do collect eggs from birds. But what would be the utility of gathering eggs? Well, maybe some of you uh, are aware of the fact that <clears throat> when DDT was thought to be a a harmful agent for the production of, for laying down calcium in eggshells in birds, one of the important sets of data that actually showed that there was a time, there, there was a chronology to this effect, was looking at eggs in museums and measuring the thickness of eggshells. And that study showed that yes, indeed, before the DDT era, eggshells were, you know, X thick. After DT, DDT was used, those shells became much thinner in some birds, in those birds that are high level, um, uh, carnivores that are very highly exposed to contaminants like this uh, through the food chain, adding more evidence that indeed the, the DDT was the uh, cause of eggshell thinning. <clears throat> and I'd just like to make a plug for, for Patuxent Wildlife Research Center. The Patuxent um, folks back in the 1960s did the definitive experimental work to show indeed that if you feed um, falcons, in this case, falcons, DDT, their eggshells indeed are a lot thinner. And many of the eggshells produced in our experimental Kestrel colony at Patuxent, uh, uh, they were unable to, to hatch the eggs because the eggs broke as soon as they were laid. So that was a really important study in the 
the history of Patuxent for sure, and in, in the history of wildlife toxicology. Well, there, <coughs> there's a, so so these this time series can can help us look at variation over time. There's another very interesting way we can use some of these specimens, and that is uh, to look at uh, what we think is an invasive disease here in the in the uh, in the U.S. or will be, and that's a, a fungus called B cell. B cell is a contraction of a very long Latin name that I'm not sure I can pronounce, which is the name of the fungus. What's going on? Yeah, I don't know how to do that. Okay. <laughs> Where were we? <laughs> Let's see. Here we go. Um, <clears throat> so here's a lesion on a European salamander, a fungal infection on the skin of a salamander. Really ugly looking thing. Looks really gross. Um, <clears throat> and um, we, we have seen... A few imported salamanders, and believe it or not, there is a salamander trade in this country. A few imported salamanders that have come into the U.S. Uh, with these infections, and we're quite concerned that it is uh, something that we don't want to see in our native population of salamanders. It has devastated salamander populations in Europe. Um, but <clears throat> the idea that it's an invasive disease was challenged a little while ago, and <clears throat> how would we know whether the, 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 the disease was here or not? Well, the herpetologists at the museum decided, well, well, let's go back and look at 50 years of preserved salamanders and see if we can find any evidence of infection in these, in these animals. Turns out they could not. So indeed, the, the uh, uh, two things came out of that. One, the crash in population numbers of plethodon salamanders in the east was not due to this, likely not due to this fungus, number one. And number two, yes, indeed, this is an invasive disease. It hasn't been around for a long time. So we do want to be quite careful about uh, importing salamanders that might be infected. Very interesting use of the collection to go back and look at some historical data. Well, handling all these animals <coughs> gives the folks at the museum a, a lot of expertise. And much of that expertise is directed towards um, helping solving, hopefully, societal issues. Um, <clears throat> you know, many of you have heard of uh, um, the risks of airplanes bumping into birds in flight. And you know, there was that Tom Hanks movie a little while ago where he looked at, or the, <laughs> he recounted the story of the airline that hit a bunch of geese over the Hudson came down. There was very dramatic and important rescue of the folks on the plane. Bird strikes happen quite a lot with planes, as it turns out. Bats also bump into planes, or as I like to say it, planes are bumping into bats, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> and the Air Force is a little concerned about that. So what they asked us to look at some of the collisions between bats and their aircraft. It's kind of expensive when an F-16 gets its engine blown up by a little bat, right? So <clears throat> they want to know, was there anything we can do to avoid it? Well, first of all, what bat is it? So our expert here, Susie Puerak, takes a little bit of the gunk that's left, scrapes it off the, the blades in the, in the turbines, and tries to identify the bat by the nature of the hairs that, are, that remain. And she's able to do that pretty well. And the idea is, here is that maybe this could lead to mitigation efforts. Maybe it can, uh, they can change their flight protocols or understand something about the, uh, when during the year bats might be a problem at Air Force Base X, Y, or Z, and see if they can avoid some of those things. So there's some practical problems that we can help solve as well. Um, <clears throat> another way we apply our expertise, again, there's another um, example from the armed forces. Our folks were asked to go over to a, um, an army base in Djibouti, East Africa. How many of you know where Djibouti is? Good. I had to look it up the other day, I hate to say. It's it's really tiny little place in very eastern Africa. And <clears throat> um, so they were concerned about uh, protecting the troops that were on base there. So our herpetologist went over and, gosh, they found, <clears throat> let's see if I get this right here, two species of carpet vipers, very, very uh, venomous snake. And, of course, don't want our troops getting bitten by car carpet vipers. They're, they're, it wouldn't be a good thing. Um, so 
you, they figured out something about the life history of these animals and how to avoid them and that kind of thing. An interesting little side note on that, it looked like there's some hints that the, the carpet vipers also are vectors for uh, the, the causative agent of Middle East uh, Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS, which was also something to be avoided on the base here. Very hard to, infection, it's very hard to treat. Um, <clears throat> so here's a picture of the, of the viper over here, and you can see the fangs coming out here. I'm not sure I'd really want to get that close to the viper, but you know these guys know what they're doing. I, I, this picture kind of makes me laugh. This guy wasn't really regular army, I don't think. He wasn't in uniform properly. It's one of our guys who went over there. Apparently, they had the, the army had to really get uh, strict with him because he was, didn't want to wear his shoes. So he, he had to wear shoes. I guess the difference between <coughs> army life and academic life. So here's a picture of that um, snake from my first slide. This is, in fact, a diadem snake. And the animal he ate is, I'm sure you all know this, this is a rough bent-toed gecko. I didn't know that until my colleagues told me what the identification was. This gecko, <coughs> I'm sorry, the gecko is actually native to the Middle East, not Africa. Uh, and, and how it got there is a little bit of a puzzle. Um, <clears throat> the puzzle is even more strange because there is a population of these geckos in Arizona. What are they doing in Arizona? They're native to the Middle East. Well, the hypothesis is that the, the, there was human transport of the geckos from the Middle East to Arizona and then from Arizona to Djibouti, to the, to the camp there. And then we found out about it because the snake that was collected had one in its gut. Um, <clears throat> so this is a very interesting example, if it proves to be true, of invasive species or transport of species, dispersal of species, if you will, around the globe by the agency of humans, which is <clears throat> happening more and more and more every day. Um, and I, I dare say with the movement of humans around the Earth, they're really... Uh, we can't expect that there, there isn't going to be an almost completely cosmopolitan group of species eventually on the face of the earth. But, <clears throat> um, and, and when species invade other uh, areas that haven't seen them, if they're predators, oftentimes they do great uh, damage to the local flora and fauna. It, it's certainly happening in Hawaii. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, Invasive species is something that we work on quite a bit. I've talked about invasive disease. I've talked about these geckos. And I've mentioned that we work on the North American collection. Well, part of understanding what the fauna is like in North America, part of understanding how and when we can recognize an invasive species is really helped out by the fact that we have this worldwide collection at the museum and can see, understand, and, and recognize an invasive species when we see one. Um, <clears throat> it's not just our folks that work on the collections at the museum. There are researchers from all over the world that come by, as I mentioned, and particularly folks uh, from North America. Um, here's a study that was done by one of our colleagues in USGS who lives in Colorado with, at the Colorado um, Science Center out there. And he was interested in the distribution of the hoary bat. You can see that sort of frosty fur on the ventral side of that bat up there, hence the name the hoary bat. Uh, the hoary bat is um, a migratory species, but we really didn't know much about its migration. We didn't know when it was migrating or where it was migrating. Um, and the interesting thing about this bat is that it accounts for about 40% of all the mortalities of bats around wind towers. Now, wind tower production is ramping up greatly, especially in the middle part of the country where, you know, in the Midwest where it's flat and there's no barrier to, to winds. Um, <clears throat> and the siting of wind farms has become a sort of a, a big business, I guess you could put it that way. Uh, most of the wind power companies are, are fairly sensitive to the fact that they don't want to have problems with um, killing species on the blades of the, of the wind tower after they install the thing. They want, they'd much rather know where to put the thing in a safe place before they get going with it. So 
part of the part of the goal here is to identify those areas of the country and maybe those seasons of the year when uh, bat strikes are most likely to occur. And Nahori bat is one that we really are concentrating on there. Um, <clears throat> So the National Collection was used to actually determine and define the migratory behavior of this bird, or uh, bird, sorry, this bat. Uh, and we didn't really have good collections in the field, uh, but the, but the uh, sorry, didn't have good field data on these birds, but the col bats. But this, the, the collections in the museum allowed, allowed this fellow to define what the schedule and, and spatial distribution of migration was. And those data have been used to help site wind, wind farms. Uh, in the Midwest. Well, <clears throat> most of the previous examples I've talked about were conservation questions um, having to do with individual species or maybe a predator and a prey. But sometimes there are larger questions that we deal with, questions of much larger scope. And <clears throat> an important one that's been ongoing for a while is uh, the uh, crisis in amphibian biodiversity. Maybe some of you know that um, frogs and toads and salamanders and other amphibians have been declining worldwide. It's been recognized now for about 20 years uh, that there's been a, 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 a real crisis in amphibian population numbers worldwide without really very many answers about why it's happening. Um, so evidence had been really mounting, and in the 1980s, I think people, people came together and realized that something more comprehensive, some more comprehensive data about the scope and nature of the problem was really needed. But amphibians have a, uh, so the, there are no dearth of ideas about why it might be happening, but the definition of what was happening is what was needed initially. Amphibians have a very complex lifestyle. They, you know, start out in the water, they lay their eggs in the water, and then they move on to dry land. That's the amphibios, two life, two lives. That's the, the, the Latin derivation of amphibian. Uh, and they, uh, so they're, they're uh, subject to habitat alteration, habitat degradation in two different habitats, land and water. Uh, they also have a very permeable skin. Uh, in fact, all amphibians are quite you know, slimy or have wet skin, and many of them breathe through their skin. In fact, many of them um, don't have any lungs and gather oxygen in only through diffusion across their wet skins which is kind of interesting. Here's another little uh, um, natural history fact for you. Anybody know what this is up here? Very good. Who said that? Yeah, this is a, a limbless amphibian. Looks a little bit like a snake or a worm or, you know, whatever. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, it took, it, it's actually an amphibian, has no limbs, crawls like a snake, um, and, and uh, really a very fascinating animal but indeed it is an amphibian. So <clears throat> uh, what was needed here in, in the, uh, to define the scope of the problem was a, a series of, of good monitoring programs. But how are we going to do that? Well, the folks at the museum put together this, uh, 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 the initial book they put together was in a series called Measuring and Monitoring Biological Diversity, and they, they did this for the amphibians basically developed some standardized protocols for designing a monitoring program, um, going out and, and training volunteers and others to, to carry it out in a regular fashion so you get uh, you know, quantitatively defensible data. And then <coughs> um, helped uh, also in here was help analyzing the data uh, that were gathered with those methods. So this is essentially a, a how-to book or maybe even a self-help book. And um, it's been very, very influential, had many, many thousands of references over the years, uh, translated into several different languages, and really has provided uh, guidance for uh, amphibian monitoring across the world for the last 20 years. It's really been very influential. Um, and I think uh, uh, that's the kind of thing that the folks at the museum can help with, having done these kind of uh, monitoring programs themselves in the field. Um, so these methods were used in the U.S. Uh, too, of course, and uh, it is the basis for the North American Amphibian Monitoring Program that we ran out of Patuxent. And that's a series of, of methods and, and protocols that we designed for states to use, and we kind of import the data, or uh, export the method to the states, and then they send us the data back. 
uh, and we've developed some very good information on amphibian decline through those programs. <clears throat> Another very interesting issue with regard to amphibian monitoring is they're not very readily seen, kind of like bats. They're, you know, <clears throat> except for frogs and toads who sing in the springtime, uh, you're really very hard to find these animals. Um, and actually, when you think about it, it's the larval stages that uh, are the most abundant life form. So <clears throat> one of our, our herpetologists figured out that, you know, really, some of these monitoring programs would, would yield a lot more information, and we might be able to find many more of them if we looked at the larval forms. I mean, you can imagine, you can remember back when you're out running around in the springtime and you see big masses of frogs' eggs in an ephemeral pond or something like that, and then they all hatch and they're oodles and oodles of, uh, of little larvae, tadpoles running around. They're easy to find, easier to find than the adults, actually. But we really don't know how to identify them. If you go to a pond and you scoop up some water and you get a whole bunch of different tadpoles, what the heck are they? So <clears throat> uh, uh, Roy McDermott and our group and his colleague Ron Altig put together a guide to the larval amphibians of North America. It's been very helpful for us in North America then to do a more comprehensive job of, of censusing the, the, um, the, the amphibians in North America, very widely used. Published, it's a very difficult thing to do, actually. And it turns out we had a lot of these amphibians in, in preserved in alcohol in the museum that we didn't know what they were. So it was helpful for us uh, in the collection as well. Um, <clears throat> one result of all this attention towards amphibians is uh, that a couple uh, new species have been found. And one of them is kind of, a, it's kind of an amusing story. You usually think of finding new species you know, out in the middle of nowhere where nobody's ever been. Well, there was a new species of frog found in New York and New Jersey, probably the most heavily populated portion of the U.S., sort of right under the gaze of the Statue of Liberty. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, there was a graduate student in, I think he was at Rutgers, who was doing some frog censusing, and he heard this song that he thought was, that he'd been calling a leopard frog for whatever, many years. And as he started to listen to it, he realized it was a little bit different. Well, <clears throat> he collected this frog, and indeed, it was a different frog. Uh, <clears throat> it was uh, on, identified initially on the basis of the call, but then when they went back and did some DNA sampling of both this population and other populations of leopard frogs, they found that it was quite different. And it was declared a species about three or four years ago. It's now Lithobates, Lithobates caufeldi. And uh, <clears throat> um, maybe you know a leopard frogs. How many of you took biology and dissected leopard frogs? Is there still a rana pibian? No. Uh, they're no longer rana. They're now uh, lithobates. Oh. Yeah, lithobates pipians. Right, but they've been divided up now to the uh, Atlantic coast frog and then other, other leopard frog subspecies as well. Um, but uh, cowfeldi is really a, a separate, complete species. And then the interesting, so this was someone else that discovered this. And they came to the museum and said, all right, what have you got? So we started to go through, not we, not me, but they started to go through their um, specimens and found that we had a whole bunch of these Lithobates caufeldi in our collection mislabeled as Ronopipians, now Lithobates pipians. So species can be found kind of right under your nose in the collection as well as out in the field. Um, and our, our folks have have described something like 74 or 75 new species over the, over the last 20 years. Uh, most of them found in the field, fewer of them found in the collection. But new species are still found today. Um, in fact, there was something on the news yesterday about a new giant rat that was found in the Solomon Islands. I don't know if anybody of you saw that, uh, saw that uh, news report. It was kind of interesting. Uh, a fellow was there and worked just tirelessly to... to um, uh, he had heard about this rat, but hadn't seen it, had seen little evidence of it, scat and little bits of food midden and stuff like that. Finally found the thing after many years, big rat about this size. I'm not sure I'd really want to see a big rat that size, but anyways, he did. <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> this talk has been just a, a little bit, a sampling of the work that we do at the Biological Survey Unit at the Smithsonian uh, 
uh, Natural History Museum and some of the uses that those data are, are put today. Uh, we've got some really interesting projects coming up in the future that I wanted to mention to you. Uh, the subspecies of North American birds are getting a complete overhaul so that uh, we will have a much better idea of, of which are subspecies and which aren't and which of those need protection under the Endangered Species Act is an important outcome of that. Um, and they're going to be using new genetic material, uh, new genomic methods to identify these subspecies. And as I mentioned earlier, what tends to happen in many cases when we have, uh, when you go back and look at subspecies that were um, initially described on the basis of morphological characters, the genetic characters often bring them back together. So uh, it sort of cuts down the work of the Fish and Wildlife Service, I think, for producing um, recovery plans for many of those subspecies. Another important uh, thing we're doing is an all birds phylogeny. Now, by all birds, I mean all birds worldwide. Uh, they're applying some new genetic methods to uh, called ultra conserved elements, for those of you geneticists in the audience, uh, using those um, repeatable uh, sequences of genes across the entire uh, genome of birds in the US to try and, and get a better idea of what the phylogeny of birds worldwide is. It's going to be a big project. There's something like 11,000 species in our collection that are going to be uh, looked at, so it's going to take a while. Um, <clears throat> the microbiomes of North American waterfowl. Microbiome refers to the, the cast of characters in your gut, the, the, you know, the bacteria and, and other microorganisms in your gut, which we're learning is a very important bit of information for human health and clearly for the health of other animals as well. Uh, there's an awful lot of immunological uh, uh, interactions that go along uh, in the microbiome in the gut. And one particularly interesting uh, reason why we're doing it in waterfowl is because waterfowl are the um, uh, agent that transmit, uh, transfers um, avian influenza, which can indeed be a human pathogen as well. So we're interested in knowing which of these animals are going to be you know, adequate carriers of the influenza virus and which of them might be able to uh, take care of the virus uh, in their gut. And then, <clears throat> uh, as I mentioned uh, about, uh, uh, implied, I guess, a little bit when I'm talking about frogs, we need to, do, or we're hoping to develop some better methods for detecting frog calls. There are all sorts of, of uh, technological advances these days, like even your cell phone, that can be used in, in, um, for auditory sampling. And there are indeed apps that maybe some of you have where if you out and you hear a bird that you don't, you can't identify, you hold up your cell phone, and sometimes they can identify it for you. Kind of cool. Uh, we'd like to do that for, for amphibians as well. Um, and then, <clears throat> you know, I mentioned that the, probably the first thing that gets done when a museum is, is initiated is to uh, go out and, and do a, a wonderful field trip and collect all the animals you can. The first expedition from the biological, big expedition of the biological survey was into the southwest of the U.S., Arizona, New Mexico, along the uh, Rio Grande and, and the borderlands with Mexico. So those specimens are old. Uh, the expedition we don't think was quite as thorough as it could have been. There have certainly been animals that have been moving around since then in the last 120 years, so we want to go back and sample there. And gosh, we might even learn something that would be important for you know building a wall between uh, Mexico and the U.S. So uh, part of what we want to do, not part of, but a large part of what we want to do with the museum is prevent extinctions. And this really beautiful specimen of a Carolina parakeet at the bottom of the slide here is one of the few birds in North America that have gone extinct. Uh, we'd like to provide the information for wildlife managers so that those extinctions don't happen in the future. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much. I think there's a, a microphone. Can you use the um, microphones in the center of the room? You had um, the, the tray of the um, eastern red bats. There were 10 or a dozen yeah. specimens. Yeah. Um, how many specimens do you like to have? Um, I imagine you want male, female, juvenile, adult, and stuff. Right. Is there some optimum number, and does it uh, right. vary by species? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question, and I, you're not going to like this, but I can't answer that. 
Um, <coughs> uh, in some cases, we have a whole, whole heck of a lot just because a whole lot were scavenged in an area. And that's great. Um, and if it's a very common species, we'll actually go out and collect a lot, especially if there's a question that, he's, that people would like to answer with a whole lot of them. Most of the time, we have a handful. Sometimes we have one. A lot of times you have zero, so anything is, is really very, very helpful. But as you, you know, implied, there's not a whole lot of comparison that can go on with just two specimens, and even less with one. So if you're really interested in, in, a, in a particular topic that requires a series of specimens, often what people do is they go around and look at specimens at a whole bunch of different museums, rather than just go to one museum. Yep. Would you please define subspecies? Subspe oh, gee. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, a subspecies is a, um, a unit of a species that is sort of functionally independent or reproductively independent um, and, and identifiable um, by traits of some kind, usually genetic traits, identifiable separately from other parts of the population, but that can easily breed back with the, with the species, other subspecies within that population. So they're reproductively isolated by circumstance, not by physiology. That might be one way to say it. So quite related to that question is, you know, what is the current working definition of species? I know it's changed, you know, quite a bit over time. Yeah. It used to be very morphological. Now it's, right. you know, breeding populations and overlap and all this kind of stuff and stable hybridization zones and all these things. Yeah, and now, right. of course, there's all the genetics that have come in. So. Right. Are there, what are the current uh, def definitions and do they, do they vary by family or order? These are tough questions. Um, <laughs> there's a whole course on that <laughs> that I took when I was in graduate school. Uh, and as you know, things have changed quite a bit with the advent of genetic sequencing and such. Um, all of those difficulties in defining species are still there with new methods. It's just a little more refinement of what we understand or how we can describe a particular group of organisms. Um, you know, Ernst Meyer had this uh, uh, independent breeding unit concept that he used and felt that um, uh, specia the whole process of speciation had to be a geographic process as well so that there was a, a separation in some way, a barrier to interbreeding between you know this group and another group of organisms, and that was the absolute definition of a species. And, and in fact, those animals could look almost identical, but if they didn't breed and couldn't breed, then they were separate species. I, I'm thinking of in some uh, something people uh, in the in the room that are bird watchers might know of the Ampidonex flycatchers are extremely hard to tell apart in the hand only really discernible by song. And, there's, and uh, in fact, now uh, the guys tell me that they should be classified a little bit differently on the basis of their genetic, um, the, the gene sequence information. Um, this isn't going to be a very comprehensive answer for all of the theories of, of species that are out there now. But basically, a separate breeding unit is, is still the important aspect of species definition. The Endangered Species Act for, uh, does define, <coughs> um, I'm going to forget the term, uh, uh, something like special breeding unit or special, darn, I'm forgetting exactly, that can be protected under the Endangered Species Act if it's, even if it's not a subspecies, that is, even if it's not morphologically or phenologically or behaviorally distinct from the rest of the population, if it's for some reason uh, has a special status, usually uh, that status has to do with uh, 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 its importance to maintaining the population of that species. That unit can be found, uh, be accorded protection under the Endangered Species Act, even though it's not even a subspecies. It's a special breeding unit, I think is what it's called. Uh, so um, <clears throat> some of the the uh, physiological and, and behavioral definitions of a species are, are superseded by other circumstances within the Endangered Species Act. 
That's a tough question. I'm not, not prepared to give you an entire lecture on that, but yeah, thank you. Well, this one's sort of related to that one, sorry. Oh, but why do we even have species? Why isn't everything just continuously and gradually slight variations from everything else? That's a very philosophical question. I don't know why we don't. If why we don't? I don't know why we don't. How we don't probably is, is an easier question to answer. But, um, well, <clears throat> that's a, I think what happens in, the easy answer is that what we see is that hybrids are not fertile in many cases. You think of a mule. Um, and that, that kind of mule example applies to uh, reproduction between many similar species. The offspring are not fertile, so that uh, the, the numbers of organisms that form the gradient just don't persist. Now, that's, a, that's sort of a fact on the ground. Why that is, you know, might be a little more, more philosophical. I don't know. Yeah. Why it should be that way, I, I'm not quite sure. Any other easy questions out there? <laughs> These are fun questions. Any more questions tonight for John? Well, um, I wanted to say I know of you, I know at least half of you dealt with horrendous traffic. I was aware of that. I didn't think I'd even get back here on time to introduce John at 7. I apologize, uh, but I wanted to remind you that our lectures are always recorded and archived, and they'll be online. And so if you didn't catch the very beginning of the talk, It'll be online. It'll usually take us a couple of days to get it posted, but it'll be there. So I apologize. Um, but I am very grateful that you persisted and did come out to join us tonight. Thank you very much. And thank you, John, for a wonderful thank talk. Thank you. So everybody go home and get your bird books out and go birding this weekend. <laughs> <laughs>